So non-communicable diseases are in the rise in Canada and poor diet is closely linked to these diseases. Recently, government authorities have identified the food environment as a priority area for action due to its role in shaping population intakes. Packaged, processed, and foods consumed away from home are typically of lower nutritional quality and make up over two thirds of Canadians' diet. Health Canada has proposed nutrition policies which are guided by threshold amounts of sugar, saturated fats, and sodium. The World Health Organization has urged governments to use nutrient profiling models which rank foods according to their nutritional composition. Various countries already have established policies for regulation of marketing to children in front of package labeling guided by nutrient profiling models. The objective of this research was to apply three nutrient profiling models uh, used internationally. The UK Ofcom model, the FSANS nutrient profiling scoring criterion, and the French Nutri-Score system to evaluate Canadians' level of adherence of the food and beverages consumed to these nutrient profiling criteria. The 24-hour dietary recalls from the cross-sectional 2004 Canadian Community Health Survey Nutrition was used to create dietary scores for each respondent based on the criteria for each nutrient profiling model. Overall, each nutrient profiling model showed similar results, with the dietary quality of Canadians tending to be in the middle range for healthfulness. These results are similar to studies conducted in European countries that use nutrient profiling systems for nutrition-related health policies. For example, my research found that the average score for Canadians using the Nutri-Score model is 6.7, while st studies in the European context found the average score to be 6.0. In the Nutri-Score model, a lower score indicates a better nutritional profile, and scores range from negative 15, which is healthiest, to 40, which is most healthful, or sorry, which is least healthful. In summary, findings of this research highlight the importance of focusing on nutrient profiling and policies to improve the healthfulness of dietary intakes. Findings of this project and our validation work may inform nutrition policies in the area of restriction of marketing to children and front of package nutrition labeling. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll open the uh, judges questions with Umit. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Adlea. Uh, this is very interesting. Obviously, we kind of uh, all know these labels, and they are in our lives. And it's 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 great that you uh, kind of looked at them. My question is: um, when you look at the, um, especially from the study that you have uh, undertaken, and moving to a kind of a policy end, there are a couple of uh, pieces, at least in my mind, they seem to be missing at least for me, not in your study. Uh, for instance, you know, what, what happens between the label and the individual who's looking at the table, label, who may not even be looking at the label, like that in a kind of a micro, uh, micro stat, what societal level, what factors like from literacy levels to sociocultural background or the education, socioeconomic status of the individual, the price, there's so much enveloping that interaction between the individual and the label that I have a hard time to put so much on the label as a determining factor of that healthy lifestyle, right? So, or the, you know, minimizing of the health effects of bad food. So I guess my question is, uh, if you were to continue in this line of inquiry, how would you uh, include these other factors that, that enter into the equation so that the policymakers can make better, kind of a more holistic use of the study uh, when making decisions, including, I would say, even mixed research, like what other types of, you know, uh, research would you conduct or with, in a team uh, looking at, you know, individuals' experience of these labels? I hope I'm making sense. Thanks. I think so. Yeah, it's quite complex a bit because um, people definitely choose what they purchase uh, based off a lot of different factors, as you were saying, like price versus like nutritional composition. Um, and the whole idea kind of is working with changing the food environment. Um, and so some ideas that come from using uh, nutrient profiling systems is that the front of package labeling, it's supposed to be something that's clear, very simple, um, easy to read. So you always kind of place it on like the same spot on the food front of package. Because right now we already have comprehensive nutrition labels on the back, but a lot of people I think don't really use that, don't fully understand it. So the kind of idea is to change that into doing a front of package label that's really simple. Um, you can do that in either like the UK, they use a traffic light system. So it's kind of green is good, red 
uh, higher in these nutrients you probably want to avoid. So doing something simple and intuitive on the front of the label. Um, and then some research, research shows that it might actually cause some reformulation of these packaged goods because manufacturers want to get more of the labels that are healthier. So if it's like a simple change that they can make in the reformulation, they're, they'll be more likely to change to be uh, have a better label. And yeah, it's just supposed to be something quick that people can look at and say like, oh, I'm looking between you know, two different varieties of the same kind of product, like either different brands or different flavors, and they can quickly see that like one is healthier than the other. Um, so that would be another way. And then um, as I was saying before, it also it kind of relates to restriction of marketing to children. So um, if you're not able to advertise, less likely that so many kids will consume those kind of foods if they're not seeing the advertisements for them. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question a little bit. Okay, Tammy. Hi, thank you. Um, so Oma took my question. So what I'm going to do is make a harder question for you. Um, <laughs> not entirely fair, so I'll, I'll offer that context. So I think what your study does really well is trying to look at which nutritional profiling model best characterizes the nutrition that really matters for health and mortality, right? But then there's a matter of, you know, getting people to grab those things off the shelf. So in a hypothetical world, if you had all the resources you needed, how could you design an experiment in a Canadian context that would let you judge, realistically, you have to implement this, um, that would let you judge which labels be are best designed to push people towards the products that are, have the best nutrition? Uh, the first thing that came to mind for me would be if you did some sort of study that you could try out different, what different labels would look like, and then do like a survey with people to see which one they thought actually influenced them the most with making their decision. Um, yeah, it's a bit tricky, but like, yeah, I think about like 46% of uh, Canadians dietary intake or energy levels come from packaged foods. So I think ideally you would want some sort of thing, maybe even in like grocery stores of kind of leading people more towards fresh foods. Um, so this is really, yeah, just focusing on the packaged foods. But um, yeah, I think if like to answer your question, as I was saying, just trying to try out different labels and see which has the biggest effect or, yeah, just a survey, I guess. It is, it is a tough question because we know that for any social science um, kind of experiment, bringing these things into the real world can be much, much more challenging. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Claudia. Hi, thanks. Um, really interesting study. Um, having a little bit of insight into working with those data, also appreciate the challenge of using those nutritional data. So, um, so good on you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess um, my question kind of continues on with the other two in terms or perhaps builds on UMIT's um, around issues of equity. So, um, you know, there, there is the issue of literacy and, and, you know, to be able, different groups to be able to, um, you know, uh, appreciate the information and use it. But what about just the sheer um, question of access to good food? So, I mean, how would you, um, envision either from a policy perspective or further study to be able to link what you're doing on the nutritional labeling front with the bigger issue of, okay, great that it has its label, but does that better product exist in a grocery store, you know, equitably or equally across all populations or are some disadvantaged? So how would you foresee perhaps addressing that question? Um, yeah, that's a tricky question. Um, so just to kind of clarify, so you're kind of saying like, how would this kind of be more broad and be able to influence people of all socioeconomic statuses or? Well, yeah, like how do you, uh, you know, so um, from a policy perspective, you know, folks are going to come at this from, from multiple. So the end goal is you want to have Canadians have you know, consume the best food, right? And part of that is, you know, giving them information about the choices that they make, but also it's sheer access to food. 
Um, and so how do you see sort of using this information, but also perhaps thinking about how this fits with the fact that there, you know, there may or may not be differential access to, to good food in, in Canada, but in other countries. So, um, you know, how would you kind of explore that? Um, yeah, again, I think just making the labels very simple and intuitive. And if there could be anything that maybe kind of indicates like, oh, this food is low in fiber. So you might want to pair it with something that's high in fiber, like pair it with fruits and vegetables. Um, or this food is, you know, lower in calcium. So try and pair it with like a dairy food or something that's higher in calcium. So if there was some sort of kind of labeling that kind of connected foods and helped someone make a more like balanced meal might help because then if, yeah, you're in an area that you're eating mostly more processed foods, maybe it will kind of trigger people to think like, okay, how can I get, you know, more fruits in with my like oatmeal and then try and go for like canned or frozen fruit, something that way. Okay, so Monica. Hi there, thank you so much for, for the presentation. I, I, um, I guess it's kind of the same theme of, of questions as we go down, but I'm wondering if, there would be further data sets that would help in discussing, you know, maybe targeting particular health issues as it results from um, poor dietary intake. If there's some data sets that would help further um, talk about the, the need to policy or for po policy changers to make the, the change, have you thought or explored or are there gaps that you wish you had data um, to be able to help support further? Yeah, so that's kind of what my um, second study I think will look more into is kind of different health outcomes. I'm going to be specifically looking into like cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality. Um, so, yeah, I think using different data sets that way, looking at that and then maybe kind of comparing with like the European countries or other places that already have these policies in place. Yeah, I think that will be really where you'll, where you'll see a big importance for different nutrition uh, profiling systems to be used and how it can make a bigger impact. Hugh? Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your, uh, your presentation. I have a question more on the tactical level. I see that you pulled your data and you use some uh, age variables and also gender variables. Did you run a subsequent analysis um, doing exactly what you did, breaking it down based on those uh, gender and age um, cuts that you'd already uh, brought into the data set? Just um, so we're kind of in the process. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I just don't know if there's anything interesting or, or, or something that you can kind of some gems that you can glean from that. Yeah, so we're kind of in the process of working on that right now, doing a bit more, a deeper dive into the descriptive analysis there. Because um, I just started my master's in September, so I'm kind of still at the beginning and still working on some of this stuff. But yeah, that's in process. So we, I don't really have any of those results yet. Thank you. But we're looking into it. Okay, judges, open floor. Does anyone else have anything for Adelia? had uh, one small question. I noticed that you're using, it was 2004 and 2015 in your study. Um, there's always problems in trying to bring together uh, different years, either in the context or in the variables that you're using. I'm wondering if you have any concerns there. Um, so yeah, we're looking at both right now. The results I just presented on were for 2004. Um, and we want to do 2015 to do a little bit of like a comparison. But when we are going to be looking into the different health outcomes, I'll mostly just be focusing on the 2004 because that data is linked to the um, like the DAD database and the different health outcomes. So, yeah, it's kind of just for now, just doing a bit more of a comparison. And then later on, we'll kind of be focusing, I guess, more on the 2004 just because it's linked to the different health outcome databases. Anyone else from the judge group? Claudia, you're looking unmuted. Do you have anything? Um, no. Well, I do one. So you've you've taken on a really difficult database, like I um, having a bit of insight. Congratulations. It this is this is that kind of analysis and that kind of data where 
the final result looks like it was really easy, <laughs> but I appreciate how difficult that was because, um, and so to the next, again, in the spirit of building capacity, sharing what you learn about the data, what would be one or two lessons or words of advice you would give to a researcher like yourself who want to use this data moving forward? Yeah, it is a really big data set and we had to do <laughs> quite a bit of work with it, even just with linking it to the different nutrient profiling systems. And because, yeah, we didn't have access to all the ingredients of different foods that were consumed. So we kind of had to do a little bit of like, that's why we did like a minimum, maximum, average, um, because we were kind of guessing a little bit with that. So yeah, definitely <laughs> kind of a difficult data set to work with. And we, there were some gaps that we had to fill in, which is where I think like a lot of like my background in dietetics really helped um, just because I think there were some food items that didn't have all the like carbohydrate amounts or different nutrient amounts. We kind of had to like look that out and kind of find a way to fill those blanks in. So definitely, I think if you want to work with this, I think a background in nutrition and dietetics is definitely helpful. And because it's all on 24 hour food recalls, which is kind of the best way to look at what people have been consuming. Um, good to know kind of how that actually works and how people are likely to kind of underreport or overreport different aspects of it. Um, and what kind of methods you can use to look to try and kind of get out the misreporting. So well, con congratulations. And, uh, and I do hope you have a chance to share that knowledge with uh, with other users of the data. Thank you. I hope so, too. <laughs> OK, so in the um, in the three sort of food labeling methods that you look at, what were the results in the countries in which they actually exist? Uh, in terms of how much healthier diets got, like just kind of building on Tammy's question, like surely the the countries that implemented these took a look at diets before and after. What what kind of things can we learn from from their experience? Um, yeah, so I think with like I mentioned one, the NutriScore one, which is kind of used mostly in Europe, um, you can see that people are healthier. It wasn't a huge difference, but they were eating consuming healthier diets. Um, and I think what would be more interesting is when you look at, um, when I, I think when I look at children specifically, I think there might be a bigger difference, especially for countries that have the restriction of marketing to children. Um, and I know, I think Quebec right now is like a world leader in for restricting the marketing to children. And so it'd be really, it would be cool if I could kind of see the difference between Quebec and Canada in the broader respect, but, um, yeah, I think the, that's where like we'll see the biggest results. Okay, and then uh, just uh, there's been some movement from you know the grocery chains here to do kind of some voluntary stuff, right? Like you have so you have you know the regular one, and then you have the blue menu one. Um, mm -hmm. How would that sort of fit in the context of this regulation uh, for these packages? I think well. Yeah, I haven't really looked into specifically what the criteria is for like the blue label or like the health, different health check marks um, kind of thing. But I imagine, I don't know, that they would just stay or kind of, I don't know, do whatever. And then just have to make sure that the front of packaging that is required by everyone is always like consistently in the same spot, easy to see and understand and isn't like kind of interfered with by these other um, health check marks or different things. Okay, great. 